Mopila uprising of 1921, a historical background. Much before the advent of Muslim kings and dynasties in South India, the people living in the western coast of India had accepted Islam peacefully at the hands of traders and whom we will call Sufi saints. It was later in the 13th and 14th centuries that Muslims from North India entered in South India. The entry of the Muslim armies in South India did not affect the Malabar coast. There the Muslims had entrenched themselves as traders and in many cases they also served as the admirals of the then rulers called the Zamorans. The landing of the Portuguese on the west coast of India, especially on the Malabar coast, has great significance unlike the Arab merchants who chartered the waters of the Arabian Sea and made the Malabar their home. Never intending to depose the rulers, the Portuguese expeditions were mainly concerned in displacing the Arab seafarers and imposing their hegemony on native dwellers of the lands we call Goa, parts of Malabar, Gujarat and even the Malacca archipelago. The accommodation and tolerance extended to the Muslims by the Hindu kings was primarily because of the prosperity that they had brought to the land. When the Hindu kings saw in the Portuguese a powerful contender for that role and felt they could bring better benefits in terms of revenue and military wherewithal, all of them except the Zamorin shifted their patronage to the new arrivals. The initial Zamorins or Samudris who were the rulers of the Malabar area supported the Arab traders because they served as their admirals and kept the revenue coming in through sea trade. But after multiple Portuguese victories, they succumbed and eventually handed over one of the most illustrious Arab admirals called Kunyali Marikar to the Portuguese who took him and beheaded him. The Battle of Talikota, 23rd January 1565 is considered a watershed battle fought between the Vijayanagar Empire and an alliance of the Deccan Sultanates. The defeat of Ali Ramaraya led to the eventual collapse of the polity and reconferred Deccan politics. We bring in the story of the Battle of Talikota here to primarily show how certain historians can twist facts to portray their point of view, especially the so-called nationalist historians and the orientalists. Historians like Herman Kolke and Detmar Rothman state that the Vijayanagar side was winning the war until two Muslim generals of the Vijayanagar army switched sides and turned their loyalty to the Sultanates. Many scholars reject this account of treachery as a post-battle speculation which was exaggerated upon by national historians in their quest to identify traitors upon whom the responsibility of any and all Hindu defeats can be entrusted. Colonial era historians Robert Seville, Jonathan Scott et al. drawing from the accounts of Firishta and later nationalist historians Alaru Venkatarao, B. A. Saletore, S. Krishnaswami Iyengar, K. A. Nilakanta Shastri et al. lends the battle as a clash of civilizations wherein the quote unquote Ram Rajya of Vijayanagar, quote unquote Hindu Balwak state fell to the Muhammadan conquest driven by religious bigotry. Richard M. Eaton rejects that there were any religious motives behind the battle and described the civilization hypothesis as orientalist scholarship which ignored the multiple alliances of Ramarajya with different Muslim rulers at different spans of time. Romila Thapar, Burton Stain, Sanjay Subramaniam, Muzaffar Alam, Stuart M. Gordon and other scholars agree with Richard M. Eaton. The book Tahfat al-Mujahideen, written mainly after 1583, deals with the chronological, political and military accounts of the Zamorans of Calicut and their naval commandants, the Kunyalis, in their fight against the Portuguese. The introduction by the author sets forth the reasons which compelled him to write this historical work. It is mainly to stir the Muslims into a jihad against the Portuguese who oppressed the Muslims and natives of Malabar. In the first chapter, he traces the merits of jihad giving verses of the Qur'an. The second chapter gives an account of the emergence of the Muslim community in Malabar. 
In the third, the author narrates the customs and manners of the indigenous people. After these three chapters, he gives a detailed account of the Portuguese advent in 1498 till 1583. Such details lead us to the life and conditions of the Muslims in Kerala. Before the arrival of the Portuguese, the Muslims enjoyed respect and prosperity in the region. The Portuguese arrival spelled the end of their trade superiority and monopoly in coastal trades. As a community, they also lost their vigour for martial activities, including jihad. Subsequently, the Portuguese influence became dominant. As such, the work has a central theme to initiate a jihad against the oppressors and enemies so that the community can live in peace and prosperity. Here, the concept of jihad is projected not to dethrone the Hindu Zamorin or to capture his territories, but to seek a peaceful life for the Islamic community in a Dar al-Harb or a non-Islamic country. This historic work has been earlier translated into English by Lieutenant M. J. Rollinson in 1833. Scholars such as Emerson and James Braggs translated this work into English. It must be remembered that the original work was written in Arabic. It is believed that Zainuddin tried his best to create a confederacy of Muslim rulers against the Portuguese, incorporating the sultans of Egypt, Gujarat and Bijapur, alongside the Zamorin of Calicut as kingpin of the Allies. His diplomatic role as a historian and as a defender of Islam was evidently the strength and inspiration for the prolonged maritime encounters of the Kunyali Marikars. The Kunyali Marikars were the veteran commodores of Calicut. He always appreciated the enthusiasm of the Zamorin and his devotion to the cause of the Muslims. He could also see the lack of enthusiasm among the Muslim rulers of the Deccan in fighting against the Portuguese, the inveterate foes of the Muslims. Zainuddin dedicated his work to Ali Adil Shah of Bijapur, whom he considered, open quotes, a zealous monarch, hearty and persistent in his endeavor to propagate the faith and root out the enemies of Islam. Close quotes. This introduction to the book Tahfatul Mujahideen by Sheikh Zainuddin Makhdoom has been excerpted from the foreword written by Dr. K. K. N. Kurup, former Vice Chancellor, University of Calicut. Director Malabar Institute for Research and Development in July 2005. Before long, the Dutch, the French and the British slowly overtook many of the Portuguese colonies with the exception of Goa. The British were however kept in check by the Mysoreans led by Hyder Ali and later by his son Tipu Sultan. After the Second Mysore War, Haider Ali and later his son Tipu Sultan took a good part of Malabar under their control. Tipu sent a large embassy consisting of 1,000 persons under the leadership of Mir Ghulam Ali Khan, who sailed from Mangalore on March 10, 1786, with four ships carrying valuable presents to the sublime port and samples of Karnataka products to be sold at the ports of call. Besides four elephants, three silver howdahs and two palanquins. The elephants were meant for the Turkish Sultan. The envoys were treated with great courtesy and respect at the capital. They were publicly entertained as proof of the sincerity and friendship of the Ottoman power towards Tipu. Some months elapsed before an audience was arranged with the Supreme Court. He received them with honour but evaded the main issue of the offensive and defensive alliances with Turkey. Tipu had proposed to the ambassadors to get the Caliph to agree on an offensive and defensive alliance where the Ottoman forces would help Tipu in the event of any offence against Mysore by sending troops. Sultan Abdul Hamid I wrote a letter expressing his great satisfaction over the successful conclusion of the Second Mysore War by Tipu. Unfortunately, during these days, Turkey was being threatened by Russia on all sides and the Ottomans had to seek the support of the British to keep the Russians at bay. And it was a very challenging task for the Caliph to agree to the terms of the offensive and defensive treaties which Tipu had sought. Another very important purpose of the embassy was the confirmation of Tipu as an independent ruler. This recognition at the hands of the supreme head of the Islamic world 
was the greatest achievement. The ambassadors brought a firman from Turkey. Despite the British machinations, Tipu secured the title of king, the right to mint coins and to have the khutbah or the sermon read in his name. The Turkish Sultan addressed him as an independent monarch. The other political and commercial objectives were not fulfilled and the outbreak of the Third Mysore War did not permit him to pursue those objectives with zeal. Having lost the Third Mysore War and subsequently the Fourth Mysore War in which Tipu was martyred, the entire Malabar was ceded to the British. This fall of Malabar led to the further marginalization of the Mapilas, who were seen by the British as supporters of Tipu Sultan and Hyder Ali and were also despised by the local Hindus for what they perceived to be the support of the Muslims to the invading Mysoreans. When the Mapilas began to notice that a weakened Ottoman Empire would put the holy lands of Makkah and Medina in the direct or indirect control of the usurping Western powers, they knew it was time to act. Their enthusiastic participation in the Khilafat movement and the non-cooperation movement throughout the region was palpable. Their rallies were disciplined and totally non-violent. The Mopala scholars organized their own meetings in support of the Ottoman Khilafah. The British police could not brook these massive protest rallies. The police cracked down mercilessly on the protesters. In July 1921, when the popular Mopala scholar Ali Musliar openly condemned the British and asked Muslims not to serve in the British army, the colonial government resolved to silence him. Hence, on 20th August 1921, they set out to arrest him from the Mambara Masjid in Tirurangadi. News spread that the British police desecrated the mosque during the arrest of Ali Musliyar. Thousands of angry villagers marched to Tirurangadi to protest the arrest and the defilement of the mosque. British forces cracked down mercilessly on the poor Mopala peasants who were simply expressing their anger at the blatant disregard shown by the British to their religious sentiments. Many protesters fell victim to the bullets of the British police force. In the face of this unremitting brutality, poorly equipped as they were, the Mopalas took to guerrilla tactics to confront the occupying forces. Kutur is situated in the Malappuram district in Malabar, Kerala. The Khilafat movement became very popular in Pokhutur. One Mamadu, a Mapila, was manager of Chinnannu or the Nilambur Kovilikam. A Kovilikam is an estate or a manor owned by a rich Hindu landlord. Mamadu was made the secretary of the local Khilafat committee. On hearing the news, the Kovilikam dismissed him from the job and tried to get him arrested in a fake case of stealing a gun. A police contingent came to Pukatur and raided Mamadu's house. This enraged the people who had assembled in the masjid nearby. A group of some 200 Khilafat workers surrounded the police force. The inspector who led the raid was forced to flee. However, the influential landlords asked the district administration to bring in the army to block the Mopila serfs from turning against them. A contingent of the British army from Koikod or Calicut marched to Pukatur in 22 lorries and 25 bicycles. Captain McKento and Special Forces Commander Lancaster led the army. About 2,000 Mopila fighters hid at Veliotoru between Pukatur and Pellakalt. They had planned to attack the army from behind when all the vehicles had crossed the bridge at Pellakal. However, one person who was not present in the final meeting of the fighters began shooting when the first vehicle reached the bridge. The army threw smoke bombs at them. When the fighters were engulfed in the smoke, the army trained their machine guns at them and began firing. However, the Mopilas did not turn back and fought bravely. More than 300 Mopilas were killed by the British army in Pukatur. The army too lost several of their soldiers, including Commander Lancaster.
The British Army massacred 246 Mopilas in an area called Melmuri in what is now called the Malappuram region on the 25th of October 1921. Even the sick and aged were dragged out from their homes and shot in cold blood. Two young girls who were trying to protect their menfolk were also shot. British officials tried to cover up this massacre, fearing that the news may lead to fresh uprisings in the region and among Muslims in the other parts of India. They had also wanted to avert international scrutiny of what was a clear war crime. The brutality came to light in the last few years due to the diligent efforts of one Mr. Samil Elekal, who works for a Malayalam media group. The British regiment that carried out this bloodbath was called the Dorset Regiment, which was based out of the Bait Barracks in Bangalore, India. Despite the balance of power in their favour, the empire on which the sun never sets could not dislodge the brave Mopulas from their well-entrenched positions. For nearly six months, the Mopula leadership ran an efficient parallel government, which they even called the Khilafah or Caliphate, in the Ernad and Walwanar region. Among the brutalities carried out by the British on the Mopulas, and those who supported them for the cause of the Khilafat, as well as to free themselves from the yoke of the oppressive landlords, the wagon tragedy is the most spine-chilling. Having rounded up prisoners randomly, even if they were non-combatants, the British authorities were faced with the problem of housing them in the Malabar. After arranging for a speedy conviction through the martial law courts, a hundred prisoners were sentenced to long jail terms in Coimbatore, Velour and Bellari prisons. Of these prisoners, ten belonged to relatively rich land-owning families. The entire lot of a hundred prisoners were herded into a single railway wagon which was otherwise reserved only for carrying luggage. Being newly painted, even the few vents were blocked with paint rendering the wagon completely airtight. The wagon was attached to the number 77 Calicut Madras passenger. It left the Tirur station on the 19th of November 1921, headed to Bellari with this unfortunate human cargo. The police constables accompanying the prisoners were seated in a compartment right behind the goods wagon. The sergeant was in a second class compartment closer to the engine. The ill-fated train steamed out at 7 p.m. It made a stop at Shoronor and then at Olvacord. The policemen who accompanied the prisoners of course could have heard the cries of the prisoners begging for air and water at these stations. But they turned a deaf ear. Several witnesses testified to having heard the screams of the prisoners at the stations wherever the train stopped. The train chugged into the Podanur station at 12.30 a.m. on the 21st November. A prominent passenger stated that he had heard desperate cries coming out from the goods wagon and insisted the wagon be opened. The authorities agreed and opened the locked doors of the wagon only to witness a disaster. 56 inmates, which included three Hindus, had expired due to asphyxia and heat exhaustion. Six died on the way to the hospital, some died the same afternoon and two more on the 26th of November. The total dead were 70. In the words of a survivor of the tragedy, we were perspiring profusely and we realized that we could not breathe. We were so thirsty that some of us drank perspiration from our own clothes. The government of Madras instituted an inquiry into the tragedy. Even though the mishap was caused by gross negligence of the officials, all the accused were eventually acquitted. The British Raj initially tried to cover up this heinous crime, but finally relented to public pressure and granted the sum of rupees 300 ex gratia to the next of kin of those who died in this infamous tragedy. The two main heroes of the Mopila uprising were Wari Kunnat Kunna Ahmad Haji and Ali Musliyar. These were the people who kept up the spirits of the Mopilas and inspired them to take upon the might of the British army. However, 
they were captured and eventually executed. Reports of Varya Kunnat's execution state that he asked the British captors not to blindfold him but to shoot him straight in the chest while his eyes are wide open. Ali Musliyar was buried in Coimbatore and reports have it that Yaqub Hassan Said visited Coimbatore where Ali Musliyar was buried and offered the funeral prayers. About Varya Kunnat it is famous that the British did not want his grave to become a place of pilgrimage hence they decided to burn his body.